I've learned my lesson. I am never going to mouth off Mother Nature because she can win. Kevin, David, get y'all some of this. It's not easy to farm it. That's why you got to have that. So welcome to season three, Corn Warriors. What am I squinting for? Sunlight. We're getting a lot of sunlight. Now, if you can't be the best at it, don't do it. June 8th, it's kind of push come to shove. We're basically planting through some of the wet stuff, around a few things. I want everything to be perfect, and especially this year, it's not gonna happen. Ain't that something? That's just two days. I said, well, my goal is to be a personal best. But our personal best is a world record. I like to have the ability to make it rain. See the corn starting to get dry again, curling up. No disease, just like what we expect. You can see where I guess some of the product we were put because we did a little fertilizer with it too, speckled it a little bit. You know, we've been hot and dry. We haven't had a rain in like two and a half weeks. Heat indexes have been over a hundred. dry weather. Can't do much about that other than pray. And there's a lot of times I'm specific <laughs> on my prayers. Good Lord, I'd like to have half inch of rain between six and nine, no wind. And we pulled tissue samples the other day. We're in good shape on nitrogen right now. But three weeks ago, we pulled a tissue sample. We were in much better shape. Pulled one last week, they've dropped. And if you notice, it's not because we don't have the fertilizer, just no water. Nitrogen moves with water, and if the plant can't, it's not picking up water, it's not picking up fertilizer. That's why we're seeing some of the, the yellowing of the leaves on the tips right in there, where things are starting to, well, that's a sucker there. So, well, most of the yellowing is on the suckers. So they're just, they're just dying out. The suckers have already happened before we did the spraying, so the spraying didn't affect any of that. Um, might help them stay alive. We typically spray with a helicopter. And when I sprayed this year with the Veltima and the Headline Amp, I stopped you know, checked things out, and we were getting coverage down to here with a helicopter. When a grower's out there have an aerial application done, the one thing they need to do is go out and ground truth to make sure the product's hitting the leaf where they want. It's important to get the leaf that you want to protect covered. So you got your main ear leaf right here. You got your secondary ear leaf right here. So I'm wanting to protect this leaf. I'd, I'd like to get to here as well. We've done a lot of trial work and rates and we know how to get it down depending on how thick and tall the canopy is what he does. And I've seen some fixed wing planes do the same thing get down there but I've also seen some of them where they're only hitting these leaves. They're not really getting down low. So for a grower, it's important for them to go ground truth because they're writing check. That stuff's not cheap. The chemistry, you're paying for that. You're paying for the crop dust. You're paying for the fertilizer. If we start getting a lot of rainfall, you know, we may spray this again. And if I can keep the leaves disease free, they're putting a lot of energy into those kernels. You know, I'm not a big fan of seeing a lot, a lot of roots above ground. You know, this, I'd rather see if we could take this set off. Need somebody like Kevin Cobb here with all his strength to break these 
extra roots off. I don't mind seeing these here, these ones that are right at the ground level. There's usually about seven sets of roots on there. And um, most of them are below ground. So there's just no moisture in here. It's sending out more roots trying to find moisture. Because it's just, there's not enough coming up. Good Lord's gonna give it to us. He's only gonna give me what I can handle. But other than that, I think corn crop looks decent. For over 65 years, Brandt has been helping growers achieve better results. We bring the very best plant health and fertilizer solutions to the farm. Through research and innovation, we help growers implement new practices that improve the quality and abundance of food, fuel, and fiber around the world. Brandt, professional agriculture. Visit Brandt.co for more information. part of the next level it's opened the growers eyes to the mistakes that they've been making that are easily fixed if you join next level i'm here to tell you the truth gaining knowledge on so many different aspects of farming what i can get out of next level we go to fields and actually show them the sins of what we've talked about in the winter now we can show hey if you tweak this a little bit more some of that low-hanging fruits is going to become available to you we discuss yield maps soil samples tissue samples how to set up a planter how to set up a combine when to spray what to spray how to spray products to buy we cover it all so we teach them everything we know we all enjoy farming but if we don't make money we're not going to be able to do it that this is going to help implement that even to the next step. The high shielding guys did what we asked them to do. What better testimony is that? Is it too late to join? Absolutely not. Next level takes a, a way different approach. We go through soil testing, tissue testing, very, very intensely. I mean, we have went from tissue sampling a little bit to tissue sampling every week, seeing what's working, what's not, what our levels are doing, you know, and then taking that to you. For me, next level gives me an opportunity to get re-energized about a crop. It forces me to go home and reevaluate what I'm doing. For nearly a century, AgriGold has been the choice of corn and soybean growers bold enough to go and grow their own way. AgriGold brings the agronomic recommendations and resources growers expect from a larger seed company combined with a first-hand, in-the-field understanding of the areas we serve. Our global breeding program and local yield results stack up against anyone when it comes to delivering at harvest. It's not luck, it's science. Be bold, go gold. good old corn warrior crew in the truck and we are going to look at some dead corn dead corn oh yeah so uh, we want to show the, the stark difference between the midwest and the southeast and the southeast with water versus the southeast without water we looked at some uh, intercropping he was there flying today praying uh, the plane was this morning they had some GoPros on the, the booms and inside the cockpit, et cetera. So we'll see. It got sprayed pretty hard with some Amplify. <laughs> I think some drip got on it. Controlling worms and insects. We have a problem with stink bugs and corn earworms. And unfortunately, some of the hybrids we plant, there is resistance to the BT traits. You close? How fast is it going? Look up, you did! Look up! Here it comes again. You stomped it. That's why! He 
You gonna come get that drone? Hmm? What's he spraying? What's he spraying for? Tail. Tail bugs. That's right, bugs. And is he trying to kill the worms? Yeah. Is he trying to kill stink bugs? Yeah. He trying to kill grasshoppers? Yeah. And three corner alfalfa leaf hoppers? Mm -hmm. Can you say that one? Mm -hmm. Say three corner. Three corner. Alfalfa. Alfalfa. Leaf hopper. Say leaf hopper. Say it. I can't. Say leaf hopper. You too need them. <laughs> I would highly encourage growers to consider, and I said this to all my next level groups, this intercropping deal. It's a big deal. The intercropping for us, corn planted the same day of corn that was planted monocrop in the same fields, tasseling six days sooner. So that's like gaining a week. And this time of the year, that's a big deal. The same chemical spraying over the top. A little bit of a strategy has to be implemented for intercropping, but crops look great, we're maximizing sunlight, and you know, we'll know in about six weeks what the yields are going to do. We'll be able to compare. We've got some fields that have foreign soybeans monocrop in the same field with corn that's intercropped, and we'll be able to tell what kind of yields were gained and lost. I know right now intercropping is maturing faster than the monocrop alone, so that's something the Midwest probably should be considering now. Before the season started, we had about 500 farmers committed to the next level to try and intercrop it to some degree. That's gonna be a big data set to be able to compare. Is east-west better than north-south planting? Is higher pops on the outside or planting it all at one population? Is that the way to go? Is 30s better than 20s and 20s better than 15s? You know, there'll be all sorts of scenarios that we'll be looking at. Not my first year intercropping, first year intercropping at the scale that we have it. A lot of it was on dry land and we've lost it due to the drought. So I was excited to see what it would do there, but Mother Nature said, we're gonna show you what it's gonna do. We got so much heat going on right now. So we're accumulating a lot of GDUs in a hurry. And when we have their best yields, it's when we can fill these kernels out See, I'm, shut, I'm just as bad as the wildlife, it's hurting my ears. One thing that we've had great success with is we get these cooler nights during grain fill. And that's allowing the plant to um, put as much kernel weight as possible. And when you can start filling these kernels out slowly, you're picking up test weight. And then depending on what your um, equation is, a lot of times people would like to say, well, it takes 90,000 kernels to make a bushel of corn. Well, we've been able to do it with like 74,000 kernels to make a bushel of corn. And that just means that kernels were extremely heavy. And being heavy like that comes with good balance and it also comes with the good Lord giving us good temperatures for long grain fill. So it's 37 right there. So we potentially had to be 16 rows around, 37 long. This is planted about 33, 34,000. So do the math, we'll see how it pollinates, how we get grain fill. Because the grain fill is gonna start down and work its way up. And then when we get that pinched deer tip back, then we'll start losing kernels from the tip down. And they just won't fill out. And if we don't get any rain, and keep this heat going on, it's just gonna keep on working back. We are able to use irrigation to help mitigate it. When we go in the irrigated field, it's usually 11 degrees cooler in the daytime, where we have, because there's just a lot of moisture going on. When we're dry like we are this year, what are we getting? What's, what am I squinting for? Sunlight, we're getting a lot of sunlight. That's key because now, you know, we're, create, we're creating a lot of energy going on here, but unfortunately, a lot of that energy is being wasted to cool the plant down as opposed to putting it in these kernels. Cools, temperatures during grain fill are key to high yields. 90 degree weather and upper 60s, mid 70s at nighttime, that lends itself to a lot of GDU accumulation. 
knowing the hybrid, um, 16 times 37 times 34 divided by, well, I don't believe it. It's saying like 238 bushel if we get rain. I don't think it's going to be that good. So, but just the math, knowing that hybrid. One year we were harvesting a corn plot and my brother Johnny walked out in the irrigation and we were using a John Deere um, S670 combine and it had the grain tank, but not the big grain tank extensions on it. Well, my brother climbed up and I was shelling corn and he could not see the combine. The corn was so tall. And that, that was a Pioneer 2089 hybrid it, and it was tall. Did extremely well. I think we picked like some 470 bushel corn that year. That's some good corn. So, but other than that, it's corn. Got decent color. I know the Midwest doesn't want rain, but we could sure use a drink of water. All right, let's get out of here. Most growers want to be 300 or 400 bushel corn. But if they're only at 225, 400 is not realistic. So a lot of times I say, well, let's set a personal best. And then I get to thinking and somebody say, well, what's your goal? I say, well, my goal should be a personal best. Yeah. But our personal best is a world record. That's not something that's going to come very easily. So now we're trying to figure out what our next yield barrier is. Because somebody's going to break 600. I don't know who it will be, but it will happen. I would love for it to be <laughs> us. But when we broke Francis Child's record, that was real exciting. It's going to take time. You got to have good weather. And, you know, we're going to do all that we can do. But if the weather's right, things that we can't control, that's when it's going to happen. For over 65 years, Brandt has been helping growers achieve better results. We bring the very best plant health and fertilizer solutions to the farm. Through research and innovation, we help growers implement new practices that improve the quality and abundance of food, fuel, and fiber around the world. Brandt, professional agriculture. Visit Brandt.co for more information. Weather markets are volatile. As we all know, the weatherman, weather woman does not always get it right, and they can change the forecast tomorrow and drive these markets directly back down. We got the Trump tariffs deal. Who knows what that's gonna do to markets. And I'm all for competition and everybody being on a level playing field, but they always talk about the black swan in the markets. We definitely got a black swan now with the weather but we also got some of the trade issues that's driving the market prices. It's gonna really suck for a lot of guys. The people that's gonna really seem to benefit is South America. If our markets go up, they've got a chance to plant crops this fall, whereas we won't have a chance to do it again until next spring. So we've gotta be smart enough to book prices and contract corn going forward um, when these markets do go up. Pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered, so there's a time to pull that trigger and get the markets priced and look two to three years out, have some, some foresight. And hopefully the, the nutrients of the world and the people that dominate the fertilizer won't look at this as an opportunity just to, to price gouge and keep prices reasonable, because that's what happened in you know, 08 and 12 and 13 when prices went to $8. Input costs went out of the roof, seed companies included, and chemical companies and fertilizer companies all went up. But they have not come back down. And that's why the margins are thin for farmers. And that's why at this point in the Midwest, there's a lot of guys scratching their head how they can survive. And what I would encourage growers to do, they're taking prevent planting, they run the numbers, they know it works. It's not ideal, but it's less risk. Get some drain tile put in. You obviously know 
you know your neighbors that had it, they got it and got it planted. They're gonna get to sell some corn this year at higher prices the way it looks. So get out there and work with your banker. For those that are considering other ways to, to do risk aversion and risk management, now they need to uh, start thinking about irrigation. I mean, it's one thing to get rid of water when they um, have too much, and that's typically to get it planted, but all of them wish they had it back later in the year during grain field. I'm about 70% irrigated, and that's what we've been doing on all the acres we can farm. And I can tell you, the landlord will not let me put, I've been asking, begging, let me put in irrigation. He don't let me put in irrigation. I'm through. I got one more year on the lease, I'm done. I won't be farming it again, because I'm not gonna continue to lose. I like to have the ability to make it rain. I don't think that if we got rain at this point, it would matter. It's, it's bad, David. The dry land is bad, 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 bad. Well, the insurance already been out. They said, look, it's over. I says, well, I'm gonna at least wait till it rains and I'll hair it up then so we don't have a total dust storm. But I fully expect dust to you know, totally come in and redo something. I don't know what that's going, that something's gonna be yet, but it's not good, right. David. I know you thought I was exaggerating. It freaking sucks. The bad part is ain't nothing in sight. It won't matter if it does rain right here. It's over. Not good at all. Depresses me.